And welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Alita Camp, and I'm a member of Manhattan's Community Board 8, an area that stretches from 59th Street in the south to 96th Street in the north and Central Park to and including Roosevelt Island. I'm here with Deb Johnny Roy, Deputy Director of Hollaback, an organization that trains bystanders to assist victims of public harassment, which includes street harassment and internet harassment. Welcome, Deb Thank Johnny. You. This is part one of a two-part series on bystander intervention for street and internet harassment. Deb Johnny, my guest, has been an advocate for gender equality in the United States and the United Kingdom for 15 years. Prior to her work at Hollaback, she promoted the rights of South Asian women who were survivors of violence and has been an active advocate for immigrant rights and against gender-based violence. She graduated from NYU with a degree in business and has a master's degree in cultural studies from the University of London Goldsmiths. Welcome again. Thank you so much. So my understanding is that Hollaback's work includes gender as well as other types of public harassment. Could you please define public harassment for us? Sure. Um, well, historically, Hollaback has worked on sexual harassment in public spaces, but of course at the intersection of racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and all the other kinds of discrimination people face. So with public harassment, we're not just talking about the traditional spaces that people think of, of the streets or mass transit. We're also talking about things like around the workplace. Uh, around the school, right? Around the playground or on college campuses or around bars and clubs, the nightlife. Um, but also we're talking about things like conferences, convention centers, airports, airplanes, and all of the other public spaces that exist. And New York seems to include all of those, unlike some other places, so you must yes. be very, very busy. Because <laughs> a few weeks ago, I attended a bystander intervention training yeah. by Hollaback to help address public harassment mm -hmm. where I met you, yeah. which was a great program. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Hollaback? Sure. I've worked in ending gender-based violence for over 15 years in the UK and the US, as you said in my bio. And I've worked on every issue you can imagine, domestic violence, sexual assault, forced marriage, so-called honor-based violence, widow's rights, sexual trafficking. And I felt like with street harassment, it was something that is so commonly experienced by such a wide variety and group of people. And unfortunately, it's what a lot of us have in common when it comes to that spectrum of gender-based violence. And so I thought, well, this is a really good place to spend my time and to commit my energies. Um, and also it's international, the work that we do, and I identify as a transnational person. I was born in the UK, my parents hail from India, and so I wanted to address an issue that was a global problem, and that's how I got involved. Oh, that's really interesting, and again, I imagine that working in New York, you encompass everything yes. from gender to sexual orientation harassment mm -hmm. to, I don't know if there's harassment from size or age or yeah. stereotypes mm -hmm. or visitors or people who are here or the disabled. Yeah. So you come across a lot. So many different kinds of harassment and often on our platform where people share stories of harassment, it might start with a story of sexual harassment but there's always other stuff at play depending on who the person is. So it sits at the intersection of their identities. What, what do you mean by other stuff at play? For example, if I'm walking down the street, I might be sexually harassed, but then if I don't respond in a favorable way or I tell the person to stop, it turns into a xenophobic attack where someone tells me to go back to my country or makes a comment about, well, you probably don't speak English anyway. So there are many different reasons why people are harassed and discriminated against in public spaces, and sexual harassment is only one of those possible reasons. Is that a more prevalent reason, do you think? Well, we know that from our, the data that we've collected over the years that that's our focus. It has been sexual harassment. But we're also seeing, of course, an increase in hate violence um, and bias incidents as well. So all of these things have always happened. And of course, harassment sits at the intersection of bullying as well. Um, so we know that people have been attacked for many different reasons over the course of history. Um, but our main focus was uh, sexual harassment, and that's changed very recently, where we're trying to expand to address 
all the other forms of harassment and violence that are taking place. Before we talk about Hollaback's mission, I just want to ask you while it yeah. occurred to me that there is harassment on campuses, college campuses. So yes. do you also, are you also involved with Columbia, NYU, St. John's, and the other schools around the city? Yeah, we've done work on college campuses. I just trained a bunch of MBA students at NYU the other day. Um, we've done work at Columbia University during that whole uprising or um, issue around campus sexual assault. So we were involved in some of the activist uh, efforts. We're also invited to speak on campuses nationally to give keynote presentations. I've personally been to Middlebury College and Kalamazoo, and uh, we recently uh, were at Indiana University. So we travel around and talk about this issue because it is prevalent in college campuses. I know. I talked to my child, who is a sophomore yeah, in college, exactly. about bringing you there because that she does. Be she's interested in in working with different kids. Yeah. So. I shouldn't have been, but I have to say I was surprised in the Oscars a couple of years ago when mm -hmm. they sang the song about, it was, I think, after that documentary. Yes, um, The Hunting Ground. Yes, The yeah. Hunting Ground. And yeah. I was surprised, and again, I shouldn't have been, to see young men up on the stage. So harassment, yeah. sexual harassment is not just directed only at women. It's not. I mean, a lot of people who are LGBTQ are also experiencing many forms of domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, that's not really discussed in the same way as it has been for heterosexual, cisgendered women. Um, but it affects everyone. Um, and the numbers do point to the fact, though, that a lot or majority of cases are women who experience sexual harassment and assault at the hands of men. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean that it doesn't affect other people. It certainly does. And those stories need to be elevated as well. So could you, since I know that there's an involvement between Hollaback and stories, uh, um, or yeah. the stories are important to your role and Hollaback's role, yeah. could you just tell us a bit about Hollaback, how it got started, what its mission statement is? Sure. Hollaback has been an organization and a movement. We like to say a movement because that's really what the intention of this work was. It wasn't to be a 501c3 nonprofit. It was to be to raise the awareness of this issue. Um, so we are working to address address the issue of public harassment and to come up with innovative solutions to age-old problems. So we work at the intersection of social justice and technology. We've built platforms to address these issues. We believe in the power of an individual story to elevate those issues, and that's why our platform is there for people to share their experiences of harassment. Uh, we also have an app. But on top of that, we also train site leaders around the world. They're, they're, they're volunteers and activists who are trying to uh, elevate this issue in their local communities because we have a method of decentralized leadership where we train leaders around the world to do this work on the ground. And we're also just trying to understand what this problem is about, who it's impacting, how it's impacting them, and ways in which we can solve this. Do you see regional or global differences from country to country or rural to urban? I mean, rural is rural to urban to suburban. Yeah. You see differences? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I find so striking about this issue of street harassment, uh, specifically the sexual harassment, is that it's very common globally, like the spectrum of what we're talking about. We talk, we're talking about verbal harassment, nonverbal stuff, um, being followed, being touched or grabbed or groped, uh, public exposure, and um, also, of course, sexual violence and assault. And this spectrum that exists, it, it's a global problem, and the spectrum exists globally in the same ways. Um, when we're talking about sexual harassment, we're talking about um, the prevalence has to do with density and how many people there are in a particular location. So when it comes to urban versus suburban or rural areas, the maybe prevalence might be different, but the way it looks is the same. And we know this from all the stories that have been collected on our site. But we also know that the response to this issue has to vary from location to location. So the way we respond to this issue in New York City is going to be different than the way our site leaders in South Asia respond to it and the way our site leaders in Central America will respond to it. And of course, those locations are incredibly diverse as well. So it really varies from region to region in terms of our response and what we're going to do about it. I'd like to talk about that, but I think yeah. we'll have to explore it a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, absolutely. So the Upper East Side in particular mm -hmm. is a fairly dense area. Yeah. And there are lots of sports bars, drinking, 
younger people, mm -hmm. crowds, no athletic facilities except for gyms, right. but is there, or do you notice anything about incidents of street harassment on the Upper East Side? Citywide, I would say that street harassment is most common in areas that are dense. So if you have a street that is full of bars, restaurants, and there's a lot of foot traffic and a lot of people moving around, it's more likely that harassment is going to happen in those places. Of course, we don't necessarily see age as an issue in terms of who's doing the harassing. People of all backgrounds and all ages are doing the harassing. Really? That's so interesting. Yeah, but a lot of younger people are the targets. We know from a study that we did with Cornell that the majority of people who experience harassment for the first time experience it before the age of 17. Wow, yeah. that is so young. It's young, and even within that number, it's between the ages of 13 and 14, the first yeah. experience. So before we talk about the different types of bystander intervention, yeah. can you just talk a little bit about or explain the, the impact of this kind of harassment on people, especially sure. when they're 13 or 14 and they're being yeah. touched or harassed verbally by strangers? I guess we yeah. all grew up with the stereotype mm -hmm. of construction workers and the mm -hmm. wolf whistle, mm -hmm. but from what you're saying, it goes way beyond any, yes. and stereotyping is a bad thing anyway, but right. it goes way, way beyond that. Yeah. And I know that there are incidences on subways mm -hmm. um, and crowded buses and crowded yeah. sidewalks, but there is a verbal component as well. Yeah, I mean, it happens uh, by people of many, many different backgrounds. And um, I just wanted to read a couple stories that, from the Upper East Side, specifically oh, from our site. So um, this one was shared with us, and it was using, we have an app, so we call them Hala on the Go, um, and it's entitled Flowers with a Side of Harassment. I was walking alone at night on my way to a comedy event when a group of at least six males approached me, walking in the opposite direction. The first one yelled out, hey, beautiful, beautiful, hey. When I didn't respond how he wanted, like I normally do, he got annoyed. I would have told him off or at least let him know what he was doing, what he was doing was harassment, but I was too scared because there were so many of them. The last man had a bouquet of flowers that I could see out of the corner of my eye. I don't make eye contact in case they think that's a sign that I'm interested. There was construction on the sidewalk where he stopped, making me have to walk closer to him in order to get past. You want a flower, beautiful? He asks while leering as I squeeze by him and continue walking. And she says, you're blank conceited, you know that? Oh, no, sorry, he yells back at her, you're blank expletive conceited, you know that? He yelled out as I continued on my way. It sounds like in addition to bystander training, there needs to be potential victim training because yeah, absolutely. this woman knew not to make eye contact yes. and not to respond, but there are people who may have been brought up to always look people in the eye and right. answer questions or respond. Yeah. And that would could create a very scary situation. It could possibly. We say to people, if you're experiencing harassment, respond or don't respond up to, uh, depending on your safety or your sense of safety. In some instances, for example, I've been with friends. Um, it's been daytime. There have been other people around. And I feel I can say something in response. I've also responded when I'm on my own. But I assess my own safety. And that's what we say first and foremost to people who are being harassed. Assess your safety. If you want to say something, keep it succinct. Um, do make eye contact. Do take physical space. And just muster up that courage to say something very short, like leave me alone. That's not OK. And then keep it moving. Don't linger, because a lot of these harassers think that you want to start a conversation if you respond in any way, which is exactly what she says here. Like, I didn't want to say anything, because they think that it was an opening. Yeah, yeah. I could imagine. And, and an initial bout of bravery when there's one or two would quickly diminish when there are yeah. five or six. Absolutely. One against six people. That's very, very threatening. Yeah. It is. That's scary. And especially if it's night and especially if there's been any kind of yes. drinking, I'd imagine, involved or anything yeah. that might make the harassers more brave than they might otherwise right, be. Right, right. Because we all know about mob activity as well, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that enters into any of this, the uh, mob mentality, anonymity. Oh, yeah. I mean, when people are out and about and trying to have a good time and have fun, sometimes when you're amongst a, a group of peers um, where this kind of behavior is normalized, it's going to compound. It's going to be more like, likely to happen because you have people kind of encouraging it and normalizing it and minimizing the impact of sexual harassment. You know, a lot of people think this is the everyday norm of a night out. 
right? right. And so that's um, a really big concern. So we're trying to change the perception that this is actually harmful. This actually does have significant impacts on people. Well, let's talk about that for a yeah. couple of minutes. What kind of impact does it have? And does the nature of the harassment mm -hmm. affect the length of time it might have an impact or the type of impact it might have? Oh uh, yeah, I think I think definitely. We've done a couple of studies with Cornell where we looked at the psychological impacts, and um, they did a content analysis. So they picked stories from our site and picked them apart, and we learned that the psychological impacts are very similar to other forms of violence, of gender-based violence. So it does lead to anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, latent depression. So that means like when you've experienced this maybe when you were younger and then you realize it later on that it was in fact um, not okay, then you might experience a latent depression. And I've seen people go through that, especially when I'm talking to students, they recall something that happened to them when they were younger and walking down the street to school. And this happens on college campuses as well. So there are those psychological and, and mental health impacts. We also see a lot of behavioral impacts. Um, we know from the stories on our site that so many people have to think about when they're gonna go out, how they're gonna go, either like, should I take a cab, should I take a, the subway or mass transit? What route should I take? Should I avoid these certain streets? Uh, should I reroute how I'm gonna get to wherever I need to go? Um, choice of clothing, people are always editing what they're gonna wear. Should I wear heels? Should I wear shoes that I can run in? Um, should I wear lipstick? Well, I mean, so many decisions. It's a, so, it's a hard yeah. way, I, I suppose, to have to, to have function to like that. Absolutely. So interveners, mm -hmm. bystanders, yeah. are really doing an enormous service for yeah. the people that they're helping because yeah. it could head off a long-term depression or it rearing its head at some future mm -hmm. point. So people should keep that in mind, that it's not just an immediate impact, exactly. but it's something much, much longer in duration. Much bigger. I think a lot of bystanders don't necessarily understand. They're, they're thinking this is an instant and I'm helping in this moment, but it actually does have a long-term impact uh, on the person who's been affected. We, we know from a, the study we've done as well is that even making eye contact with someone when they're being harassed, if you can do nothing else, um, significantly reduces that person's trauma. That's fascinating. Yes, it is. And that is crucial, I would think, for people who might want to intervene and help someone, yes. but who might otherwise be afraid. Absolutely, because, um, and we'll talk about the bystander intervention stuff, but this is the, the least that you can do. Because we know that in many situations, it's a crowded subway or a crowded street and someone's being harassed and nobody even turns around or says anything or gives no indication that they've seen what's happened. And in some cases, people don't notice, um, which, we're, why, which is why we're saying, like, we need to be more observant of what's happening. Well, there's also so, there's just so much environmental stuff going on, yes. the, the noise, the crowds, the right. lights, the sounds, that yes. sometimes it's hard to pinpoint. And then you're used to hearing about, well, let's say the characters at Times Square who mm -hmm. harass people for money, yes. and it, it's not geared to anything but getting money. Exactly. So if you tune that out, do you also tune out the type of harassment that might be racially motivated or sexually motivated? Right. Yeah, it is very likely that people are tuning all of that stuff out. And also we're, you know, more involved in our phones now as well. Absolutely. Which changes everything. Um, it really has such an impact on what we're picking up on. But the thing is, if no one does anything and it's and you've experienced it and you're in a space that's full of people, it makes you sometimes second guess what happened. It makes you feel like nobody cares. Um, and it makes it seem more possible the next time. So that's a scary thing for people. It is. And, it and really is. Anyone watching should yes. be aware that it makes sense to be right. conscious of your environment and to help people who might call out for it, yeah. even without saying a word. Absolutely. But let's turn to the uh, the various types of bystander interventions, and then we could sure. talk more about the specifics in part two. Yeah, great. So we call these the five Ds of bystander intervention, and. Um, first and foremost, we have to be more observant of what's happening around us. Uh, but if we do notice something happening on that spectrum of harassment, verbal, nonverbal, the following, the touching gro and groping that happens on mass transit, we ask people to either use, you, to use one of the five. And the first one is uh, direct intervention. And that's the one that comes most obviously to everyone's mind. And it's not always the best idea because it might put you in danger. And that's where you address the harasser directly and you tell them to stop, you tell them it's not okay, you maybe call out the behavior and say, that's racist, that's homophobic, that's not okay in this neighborhood, that's not okay on this train. 
And of course, when you do that, we suggest people be short in what they say, make eye contact, take up physical space, and just muster up your most courageous self um, when you do it. But we tell people to use this one with caution because it can escalate and it can be redirected towards you and you don't want that to happen. The second one is distraction and that's a creative way of intervening and that's really to cause uh, some sort of disruption in that particular instance of what's going on. And that's where you address the person being harassed and you ignore the harasser. And you maybe ask them for the time, you ask them for directions, it takes a lot of pretending, pretend you're lost, pretend you don't know where you're going. In some cases, depending on who you are, if you're the same age, you can pretend you're that person's friend, you go to the same school, pretend you know them from the neighborhood. And of course, that's a, a way to just disrupt that, that instance. And you're hoping the, the harasser doesn't stick around for another exactly. opportunity. Exactly, and, and it usually happens where the harasser stops what they're doing and they go off somewhere else or they just stop because something else is taking place. The third one is delegation and that's where you contact a third party and that's probably when it escalates into something a little bit more serious. So if you're on a bus, tell the bus driver. If you're on the subway, maybe an MTA employee or conductor, if you can catch them, that's not always possible in a moving train. So delegate to someone who's near you who might be in a better situation to intervene in some other way. Um, and then if you're on, if you're in school, go to the front office and report it. Um, if you're on a college campus, go to a campus building or go to campus security. Or the blue lights. Or is that the? It's yeah, it's the yeah, this, it's the universal American college campus signal security, for security. Yes, it's exactly. big blue lights, the blue lights all over the place. Exactly. So you could get security involved. If you are just on the street, maybe a local business can get involved if it's happening outside of their business. Get the manager if it's happening in or near a store. Talk to the manager. Talk to the security guard. And of course, um, people always think of calling 911 if it, if it escalates into physical violence. And in that case, we ask people to try to use distract first and get in a line of communication with the person being harassed and then see if they want to escalate it to a 911 call because some people don't want to do that. Sometimes you have to make that call on your own though. The fourth one is delay. And that's where you check in with the person after the fact. And it's something we can all do and ask them very simply, are you okay? You say, I'm sorry, I couldn't intervene in any other way at the moment, but I wanted to check in, check, check in on you. And then, and that does reduce trauma as well because it shows someone noticed. Right, right, and someone cares. And someone cares, right. You could offer to accompany them to their next stop if you're on a bus or train, stand with them on the platform, sit next to them, all of those things. And then the fifth one is document. And that's one that we also have to be very careful about. People assume document means you take footage and then post it up online. Uh, we say that's the worst thing to do. You don't <laughs> want to mention just, that wouldn't be good. Not a good thing. So if you're going to document, we ask that you make sure someone else is intervening in some other way. If they're not, then you should use one of the four Ds, other four Ds. If they are, then you can document, you can stay at a distance, take footage, take up uh, images of landmarks, street signs, train numbers, um, and say the day and the time. So in case the person wants to use it as some sort of evidence, uh -huh. you have it for them. Offer them your personal information, say, I got this footage, this is my contact information, feel free to contact me and I can send it to you. If they don't contact you, don't do anything with it. Have you seen situations where there's been an escalation to violence? And then, and yeah. then what do you, re and the one minute we have left, and then what do you recommend? If it's escalation to violence, uh, which we have seen, there's an example I use in my training, um, people have used distract uh, where they get in between the two people. That's very risky. Again, if you're like a big man, you might be able to do that. I certainly would not. Um, if you need to call it in to, a, to delegate to a third party, I recommend one of the people I listed in the particular location that you're in. Um, there's also direct intervention if you want, but when things get violent, you want to de delegate to a, more of an authority figure if possible. And have you seen any situations where the act of intervening has caused this situation to escalate? Um, I do know that's a thing that happens um, and you can't always control the situation. So we do suggest that you choose the, the D that is safest for you in that moment. Sometimes the priority is to remove the person who's being targeted away from that situation. If possible, take them to the local corner store, um, try to get them away from the situation and also use delegation to try to get more help. Well, I know that these put a big responsibility on bystanders, but it, it sounds so important for, for the health of the 
of the victim. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering about the mental state of the intervener and mm -hmm. if it has a long-term impact. But we'll have to save that for part two, okay. as well as internet harassment and, yeah. and various other programs or other ways of approach that Hollaback has. Mm -hmm. So um, this has been part one of an interview with Deb Johnny Roy, Dir Deputy Director of Hollaback, an organization whose mission is to make public spaces safe for everyone. Part two will be available for viewing soon. Please check our website, cb8.com, and click on the tab, CB8 Speaks. Thank you so much for being here. Thank it's you so much. It's so informative.